the movement. We, we wanted people um, to read the stories of the, these marchers. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, even on the front, we have some of the people, of course, Megger Evers died in Mississippi. Right. Same day Megger Evers was killed in Mississippi, Bernard Lafayette was in working in Selma and they tried to kill him. The plan was to kill civil rights people in several southern states. They only succeeded, unfortunately, unfortunately, in Mississippi. Here's Val Luzo. She was killed, of course, in Selma. Mm -hmm. And to this day... Uh, she was a freedom writer? She was a housewife in Detroit who saw the bloody Sunday yes, march and yes, said, I've yes, got to become yes, a part yes, of this. Yes. Her daughter I remember is seeing a, her story on national television. Yeah, her daughter's a part of our board. We're so gruesome and totally incomprehensible is that there are white people in Selma right now mm -hmm. that that attack her mm. and try to demonize her uh, and her motives for coming. They they sell ma they sell this demonic materials about her. Even up to today. Now to this day, and of course this is a picture of Jimmy Lee Jackson, right here. Of course this is a good one in chain in the people that were killed in Mississippi. Um, so uh, the Jubilee. Um, so let's back up before we talk mm -hmm. about the Jubilee. Let's just spend a little bit more time on the events of that day, that okay. fateful day itself. Mm -hmm. When they unleashed the dogs and police mercilessly beat John Lewis and others. Um, what was he, were, were you present there? No, okay. I wasn't. But, but from, from what you've heard, what, what was the atmosphere like in that, on, on that bridge? I just can't think of no other word but terrorism. And um, because the whole purpose was to perpetuate this ungodly belief that white men were ordained by God to rule the universe and certainly the South. Mm -hmm. And that anyone who interfered or dared to challenge their authority to do so could be jailed and even killed. And um, I think it would have been far worse if the cameras weren't there. That's what I was going to say. But it backfired in the sense that it did. those images were caught on tape. Yes. The media was there. They reported yes. on it, right? It came to the attention of the president mm. and Congress and the country. And, you know, it, it helped to change minds. It did. The, and that's the power of the nonviolent movement because, um, irrespective of how you feel about nonviolence as a tactic or strategy or philosophy, you know, they had all the guns, they had all the weapons, the dogs, the tear gas. Our people just had the determination, their will, to be free mm -hmm. and to have voting rights. And I think at that time and that space, nonviolence was the only logical, rational response to that violence. Because when people saw that response, it really did affect the consciousness of people all over the country. Mm -hmm. And but the night that Jimmy Lee Jackson was killed, the press was there too. But the press was attacked, and all the cameras were smashed. Hmm. So therefore, there's no footage of what happened. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, even among good people, racism raises its mm -hmm. ugly head. Mm -hmm. Because the death of Jimmy Lee Jackson and Bloody Sunday um, touched the conscience of America. But President Johnson really moved a little quicker and a little faster when Reverend Reed was killed. And, 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 and it's documented that the response to Reverend Reeves killing was different from Jimmy Lee Jackson's kill, killing. The white, the killing of the white man. So even in Jeff, uh, even with good people, the response was, was different. So the death of Reverend Reed really, I think, my, in my personal opinion, encouraged the president to say, look, we can't, can't wait for no amendment to the Constitution. We have to have an act that, mm -hmm. that I can get passed mm -hmm. quickly mm -hmm. and swiftly. Mm -hmm. And of course, the man that killed Reverend Reed is living in Selma right now. He has become rich mm. uh, through the ignorance of black people. He has a car dealership right down the street where he allegedly killed Reverend Reed. I say allegedly because since an all-white male jury found him not guilty, mm. but we know. CNN did a special establishing his guilt. And because of the ignorance of our people, and when I say ignorance, let me explain that. It's not taught in school. It's not talked about in churches. It's institutionalized ignorance. Mm -hmm. um, it's institutionalized in the sense that public schools and churches have been programmed not to teach it, not to present it. Right. 
So the people are suffering from a lack of knowledge, so they don't know, so they continue to go to, to support businesses that did everything they could to keep them from the ballot box. Right. And those people are still, those people are still living in Selma. It was just last year. But a majority of black city council would not be where they were if it had not been for the bloody son and the sacrifices of these civil rights people and others. Yet this majority of black council allowed two, three whites on the council to convince them to give an acre of land to an extremist group, the fathers, the friends of Forrest, i.e. Nathan Forrest, first grand wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, founder of the Ku Klux Klan, this majority black council gave them an acre of land to honor this Klansman. A majority black council? Yes. How do you explain the that? Same, the same, that's another interview, but I'm glad to give it. The same black council, when we tried to get them to name a street, after Amelia Boynton. Miss Boynton is 109 years old. She was, she's known as the mother of the voting rights movement. It was her and her husband that laid the foundation for the movement. Well, this summer, they would only name four blocks, maybe five, after her and her husband on the street with her house, Lapsley, where Dr. King came, others came to strategize and to organize the movement. A whole acre, whole acre to, here's Miss Boynton, as a young woman, she's now 109. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll give you this first story. Five little short blocks on Lapsley Street to honor her, yet an acre given to mm -hmm. a, an extremist white supremacist group to honor the Klan and the Confederate soldiers. Now that's another, I have a, I have a story about why. But well, let's get back. Let's get to that later. Yeah. Let, well, let's one let's reason why the Jubilee was started, I founded it uh, over 20 years ago, mm -hmm. um, um, is because history was not being taught. Yeah. How do you bring history alive? How do you animate it? How do you just engulf it and, and culturize it in such a way that people have to acknowledge that it's there? Right. And that's why we started the Bridge Crossing Jubilee. Stick a pin right there. Let's get back to the events of Bloody Sunday. Uh, okay. We, we talked about the impact it had on the on the Johnson administration. Uh, but what impact did it have on the civil rights movement itself at that time? Good and bad. Talk about both. Well, the good news is for the first time, we got the right to vote after 100 years, because we had it through the 15th Amendment. Mm -hmm. Black men could vote, mm -hmm. and hundreds were elected to office all over the South. Including the Senate, U.S. Senate. One, yes, from Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Congressmen, uh, legislators, mm -hmm. all taken away through domestic terrorism, by the way. Uh, so you have a restoration, a new renaissance, okay? Right. A new renaissance, a new reconstruction, where, again, we began to get black mayors, black judges, mm -hmm. black city councilmen, black, uh, black, you know, politically. Right. And then, of course, um, women. Even though the 19th Amendment gave uh, white women and all women the right to vote, it actually fueled the whole political scene. So you have more brown people getting elected, more women getting elected. So it had an impact to change the political landscape of America. That's the good side. The problem is, since the civil rights movement did not embrace the black power movement, the black is so beautiful movement, mm -hmm. the, um, the, the, the movement, uh, the African studies movement, all this was the black arts movement, mm -hmm. all these movements were going on and being fertilized at the same time. But to me, in my humble opinion, they never united. Mm. And it took all of them to bring us real strength and liberation. So you had the Black is So Beautiful movement, you had the movement, let's put African studies in school. But you never heard civil rights people talk about that that much. And you didn't hear the cultural people talk about civil rights. You didn't hear the Black Panther Party I talk about civil rights. It just was not, and and of course, the government did all they could to keep us divided and separated. Um, so the downside is because that history is not known, and because we thought that simply by getting the right to vote and the and the removal of the white only signs that we were free, and since the images of what they did to um, on Bloody Sunday and the images of what happened to Malcolm and 
Medgar and the four little girls in that church and the two little boys that were killed outside the church, we soon forgot. I never knew. And it was easy for the propagandists, the propaganda, the, the, the propaganda that America, now we have liberty and justice for all. Finally, the Declaration of Independence includes all of us. That's why to this day you have black people on the 4th of July. They don't even know that on July 4th, 1776, their people were enslaved. They don't know it. They don't know that we remained enslaved for almost another hundred years. This history is intentionally kept out of the schools. And they go to churches where they see a white Jesus. And the, and, the, and the whole myth of white supremacy is reconfirmed. There's very little knowledge of geography. Because in the Bible it makes references to places that are clearly in Africa. But we are, we are so institutionally miseducated that that, that that deliberate miseducation has distanced us from the truth about who we are. And we claim to believe that we're made in the image of God. That's what really mystifies me. Right. How can you know God and not know yourself? Right. So you ask, that's a short answer. Mm -hmm. So in the process, this we have we have generations of people, two generations, who really truly believe, especially since we have President Barack Obama, that this is a post-racial society, that there is no longer racism. My daughter by marriage teaches at the University of Mississippi. She was amazed there was a conversation between two students, a white southerner and a black upper middle class student from the South. The white southern student, and he's rare now, he's an exception, trying to convince the black student that there was still racism in America. That is typical of the attitudes of many, of especially middle class black children and brown children who are brought up uh, in, uh, in families who don't want them to struggle, who don't want them to see race. Uh, so that's the downside of it. So now we have an attack on voting, we have an attack on immigration, immigrants, attack on health care. All the things that were fought to secure during the civil rights era. And last summer when the Supreme Court gutted the heart out of Section 5, you know, what has been the outcry? Right. I think we're one of the few organizations in the South, SOS, a, a movement for justice and democracy. We've taken several buses protesting in Washington, but there were no thousands of people to embrace us because somehow even some of, the, of us who are conscious somehow believe it's, well, we'll, we'll, we'll be all right. You know, uh, uh, we, we'll be all right. Let's not worry too much about margin. Fine, let's, let's, let's segue from there to your views on the Moral Mondays uh, movement. I'm a part of it. That, 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 that is focusing on the uh, attacks uh, against voting rights. I'm a part of the Moral Monday movement. Okay. We, this past Monday, we had um, Reverend Barber was in Alabama, the state capitol. But there were not huge groups of people there. Because even though we've tried to start the Moral Monday movement in Alabama, it hasn't caught on, but, but we're building. Seven of us, including myself, was arrested during the week of moral action uh, on Voting Rights Day about two weeks ago. Uh, but we can only get seven people, but it's growing. Even Reverend Barber will tell you it was uh, seven years before they got 17 arrested. We're doing good. Two years, we got seven arrested. So. We, we are in close alliance with Reverend Barber. Mm -hmm. I've asked him to come to the Jubilee to help lead us again. Uh, he was there last year at the Jubilee for three days, giving workshops and leading marches. So I do believe there's an army rising, slowly but surely. And uh, we're working with people of all races and religions now. We're working with the Muslims. We're working with labor. We're working with um, um, Jewish people, white people. Now some people, Say, oh well, since Farrakhan is going is involved, we're not going to be involved. Well, you know what? You stay over there because we are inclusive. So if you want to play a hate, you don't play a hate on these extremist white Republicans, okay? So we're not going to let you play a hate on our brother, Minister Farrakhan. Uh -huh. So we do have a movement Good. that's building with the Moral Monday movement. Good. Well, let's talk about the, the Jubilee uh, celebrations. It's been, I mean, the what you're planning to do uh, mm -hmm. for the 50th anniversary. But prior to that, there's been a march every year. Every year. Right. And, and um, talk a little bit about the history of those marches and what's special about the 50th anniversary. What, what uh, special plans are in place okay. for the 50th anniversary? Well, give me a little um, um, 
foundational history. SELC started these marches every five years back in 1970. I just, my husband and I just moved back and we were very supportive of Dr. Lowry, but they were only doing the marches every five years. We felt that the history was so important that it was not only important to reenact the marches, but to tell the stories and to do it in a way that young people would be attracted to listen. So we decided to have many events um, to, to attract and to appeal to a variety of people of all ages. So not only did we decide to reenact the marches, but we decided to have a music festival to bring in the music. We brought in the original um, freedom singers to teach the songs of the movement. Uh, we have uh, what we call the children's sojourn, where the stories about the movement are told to the children. We show footage of what happened on Bloody Sunday, so uh, students, especially at the high school level, can begin to embrace the history. We even have parades where um, people come from around the state with their bands. Um, uh, we have workshops on voting rights, immigrant rights, health rights. So the whole idea was to have a variety of events to really begin to inspire people to embrace the history in such a way that they would act on it, that they would appreciate the right to vote, that they would move forward and to begin to think critically about candidates who would preserve and to advance that history rather than trying to detract from it. Gotcha. So what are the special events being planned for the Jubilee? Well, let me first start with our theme. Our theme really tells the story. Remember? Recommit, restore. Remember, recommit, restore. Those three are the words really tells you what the Jubilee is about for the 50th. First, we want, we want to remember. And we will have a um, memorial service for the people who died and why they died uh, that Thursday, uh, March 5th, at the Tabernacle Church which is the church that held the first mass meeting, to remember. Uh, we will have storytelling tents. We want um, the people who are still living to tell the stories. Mm -hmm. um, we want to bring young people into their space. Mm -hmm. But we also want young people to tell their stories. Because my generation, you know, some of us are so st stuck in the 60s, we don't realize of the problems that our children are facing right now. So we have an intergenerational conference where there's a sharing of stories, sharing of pain, sharing of strategies, sharing of joys, you know, to move forward. You know, I like sharing the baton. People like to say, pass the baton. You know, I have a problem with that. Because when you pass, it's like you're out of the way. But we have to be there with our young people. You know, we have to be there as advisors. And sometimes we have to be there to pick them up when they're not down, when they lose faith and lose hope and vice versa. So, um, restore, recommit. How do we begin to recommit? Well, we have to remember not just what happened 50 years ago, we have to remember what happened last year. We have to, what happened, we have to remember what happened when President Obama was elected the president. The backlash is very much like what happened when we won the Civil War and we got the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, right? I mean, not only did they kill Lincoln, but they beat Charles Sumner and that the white Republicans who were fighting for our civil rights, they, they tried to destroy them. And of course the Klan and others, other extremist groups uh, were organized to take away. Well, to me that's what happened with the election of President Obama. So we've got to remember that. You know, the attack on immigration, immigrants, health, uh, labor, women, youth, this is a complete response to me in terms of the election of this president and it is, it is history repeating itself but are we repeating history if we don't remember what happened and learn from those mistakes we will be disenfranchised for another hundred years so it's time to remember but also to recommit to recommit that that will not happen they will not take us back and of course to restore to restore the rights uh, that people 50 years ago fought so hard to secure uh, finally, uh, 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 the events. Let me give you a few of the events. Yeah, I give you that. Mm -hmm. Okay, event. Uh, to me, um, 
We will be honoring at our Freedom Flame Awards people who are 80 years old, 80 years old and older, like Dr. Lowry, C.D. Vivian, um, Andy Young, people who are still with us, Amelia Boynton. Uh, at the Freedom Flame Award, and we're asking the icons. Yeah, we're asking elected officials from across the country uh, uh, to come and present them the, the awards with a young person. Because mm -hmm. number one, the the elected officials would not be there without their sacrifice, and young people to uh, share that for time. And of course, that Sunday morning we have the mm -hmm. Unity Breakfast, uh, named after Coretta and uh, King and and uh, Dr. King, and we've had some amazing speakers. We've had um, well, we've had the vice president, the president, <laughs> uh, we've had um, um, civil rights icons. Then, of course, after that event, we will have the march. But it's not just a march of, 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 of uh, celebration. It's a march of continuation of the struggle to secure the right to vote. So we want people to know we're, we are serious. All day certain there will be workshops strategies on how to move forward, uh, to secure and to restore the right to vote, how to organize so that uh, immigrant rights and health rights and all these other rights will be protected. And of course we have a lot of youth activities going on during this time that, that will, uh, we have a youth summit, we have a, a, um, a we, uh, kids love this um, step show called Stepping Out of the Vote, but the theme of voting and um, struggle and a recommitment to securing our rights runs throughout the Jubilee. Fire, as a veteran of the civil rights movement yourself, oh. uh, I'm sure you're witnessing the rise of a young generation of civil rights activists mm -hmm. who are taken to the streets to protest the murders of young black people in Ferguson, mm -hmm. uh, Missouri, in, in, in Ohio, in New York, around the country. Uh, what words of advice and wisdom would you like to share with, these, with this new young generation of activists coming up? Remember, commit, and continue the struggle. And I, you're right, there, there are activists. But I, I was at Howard University's campus yesterday. The professor was telling me that there are so few there compared to 20 years ago, 40 years ago. So we have to do more to, um, we started a group in, in Alabama called 21st Century Youth Leadership Group. John Lewis was one of our first speakers. Rosa Parks came to talk to the children. Asa Hilliard came to talk, uh, to train and to, to inspire. We are, those type of groups have to start all over the country. We have to have leadership groups, we have to have internships, we have to have after school and Saturday schools where this history is taught since they were not teaching in school. Since the legends, are, the living legends that are still living with us, uh, we have to bring them into the same space. It is amazing to me that I live in a city with majority, 70% black, school boards black. History's not taught right there. There's no history taught of the civil rights movement in Selma. There's only one school system I know in Alabama that embraces this history, and that's the county where Jimmy Lee Jackson was killed. Perry County, the superintendent there on the board, outstanding. Mm -hmm. But efforts to try to get this history taught and embraced, then they wonder why the children don't want to vote when they get 18. They don't know. They don't know their value. They don't know their importance. Then they see some black elected officials who are mimicking some of the same policies and practices of the oppressor. Mm -hmm. In Selma, we have a, what I call a rogue police chief. He's black. But I call him the black Jim Clark. Mm -hmm. The way they violate the rights of citizens. Ferguson. We got Ferguson and Selma. A black man, 70 years old, went into churches, chicken, was a little loud, and mostly committed a misdemeanor, a misdemeanor. Under Alabama law, you have no right to arrest a person for a misdemeanor unless you witness the misdemeanor. When the cops get to church, he's gone. They pursue him, find him, and kill him in Selma. And they will not release the tape. I'm talking about Selma. Because the black is cock, the cop is black, no outcry. Mm -hmm. The problem is what white supremacy does, and the civil rights bill did not take this away. White supremacy teaches people to devalue people of color. Good. 
period. Right. And it dis distorts the mentality of black folk itself. It does. Yeah. Well, we don't value each other. That's why young black, a young black man is more likely to kill another young black man because they don't value each other. When I look at that young black man, I see somebody I hate. I see myself. When a black cop looks at that black kid, he's more likely to shoot and to arrest and to um, racially profile a black cat kid because he's been programmed to do that the same way a white officer has been programmed to do it. One of the biggest myths, and that's why we started the Ancient Africa Enslavement Museum in Selma, because the, the myth is slavery wasn't so bad. I've had people that come to the museum, white people, and say, oh my God, I didn't know it was this bad. There are white people in Selma right now, just sued some, um, who, when I was protesting this monument of this terrorist they, uh, on public property, right? Now, now it's not, no longer public because they gave it to them. Well, um, I was literally uh, pushed and attacked by one of these white men when I was filming them. Um, but anyway, at, at, at my trial, when I was taken there um, at the trial, one of the trials, um, he admitted to understand. Did you not say that slavery wasn't so bad? He also said, not only saying that rape of black women wasn't so bad, they liked it. This is the mentality of people. And like my daughter said, white supremacy is so normalized right. that no one, no one gets upset that the, the local college is right. named after George yeah. Wallace, yeah. who supported yeah. domestic terrorism. It's, it's been institutionalized. It's institutionalized. It's structuralized. Structuralized. It's like air. No one questions it because it's like air. So no one questions streets and monuments to terrorists. In, in Germany, you will not find monuments to a Nazi. As a matter of fact, the mayor said to me, I said, Mayor, would you approve of a monument to a Nazi and Selma? He said, oh no. I said, what's the difference in killing a black person? A Nazi killing, um, well, black people were killing Nazi Germany too. A Nazi killing uh, a person and the Klan killing somebody. What's the difference? Even in the museum here, the Holocaust Museum in DC, I went in there. There's no mention of the black Africans who were killed by the Nazis. So no, who values black life? You know, the black doll test, when everybody, nearly every race, would choose the white doll over the black doll, it is a confirmation psychologically how we devalue each other. And they wonder why we're still at the bottom. And that's, to me, is what we're battling against. The greatest battle we have now is the battle of the mind. Carter G. Woodson said it best. He said, 90 years ago, it is not the lynching of the neck, but the lynching of the mind that will keep us in prison and in bondage for years. And the, you know, the reggae singer Jimmy Cliff talks about they took the shackles off our feet and hands and they put Place the shackles them. on our minds. And, and they're still there for most of us. And the biblical scripture is, the biblical scripture in Hosea, is people are suffering from a, no, a lack of knowledge. And until you get that knowledge, your children will suffer. You say, well, why would a just God allow that? That's just the scripture. All I can say is that we're suffering. But there is an army rise and organizations like a state of the black world. These men and women are committed. They're steady. You will not see them in the national news. Uh, you will not. Uh, they will not get the national uh, awards and be invited to the White House. But they are steady. We are steady. And it's that steadfastness and that determination that will eventually make a big difference. Indeed. That's my hope. Beautiful. Thank you, sister. Okay. <laughs> that was great.